if someone else does it 80% as good as you could have done it, that's perfectly fine. Because when I was doing everything, everything had to be like, you know, just perfect, right? Because it's got my hand on it. But I'm okay with a team member doing something 60 or 70% right. We need to be in the 80% range if we can, right? But I don't, I don't need to get high blood pressure over that other 10 or 20%. Everybody knows that if you don't let go of some things, you're going to hit a plateau income-wise that it's over. That's, how much, that's the most amount of money that you could, you're ever going to make going forward if you don't let go of some things and empower other people to help you get where, where you want to go. Welcome back to another episode of Do Business, Do Life. Uh, Excited for today, we have another Triad member spotlight. Russ Ross, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Brad. Well, you know, as I was thinking about how to kick this one off, um, there's sometimes these just serendipity moments in life. And uh, you've been an early member at Triad, Russ, and... We had, I guess it was just over a year ago now, we, we kick off our year with the big launch experience, and, and this was how we kicked off 2023. And you and your wife, Michelle, are there, and, and we're just kind of showing up to awards night, a really cool little, uh, I'd call it a hole in the wall, but it's bigger than a hole in the wall, uh, but a place called the Copper Tank in Austin, Texas. And we're on the red carpet kind of walking in, and you shared a story with me. And I just thought that that'd be a fun place because obviously you have a family practice that you and your wife working together, building the business together. Mm-hmm. And, you know, almost three decades later, we're walking into an evening and you dropped this story on me. So why don't you share that? Because that's a fun way to start. I had just moved to Austin two days prior <clears throat> to showing up at the Copper Tank with a few friends of mine. And this bar happened to be the place where all the Dallas Cowboys would hang out at night because in those days, that's where the training camp was, was in Austin. So Michelle was there with some of her friends and we kind of got a mutual introduction and everything. And uh, almost exactly 365 days later, we made it official and and got married. So we will have been married um, uh, 29 years this year and never looked back. And then there we were because I guess this would have been 28 years after the fact, because this was about a year ago. And just out of sheer coincidence, Triad and Christy on our team who runs our experiences, we picked the copper tank and Mm -hmm. it was quite an evening. We had Amos Lee do a private concert, did did an awards night. And you literally dropped that on me that night. You're like, this is actually where Michelle and I met. (laughs) And so that had to be fun. That had to make, take the night up a couple notches. Small world. Yeah. Yeah, well, well. speaking of origin stories, and there's a lot uh, of advisors that listen to this show or watch this show, um, I find it very common. There's a lot of husband and wife teams out there, which you and Michelle definitely are in your business. And so I would just love to go a little bit down memory lane before we get to all of the success you've had in recent years. Mm-hmm. But how how did you you stumble into financial services? How How did it come to be? I know you were born and raised in Arlington. And uh, so, so what got you into the business in the first place? Well, at that time, we were actually living in San Antonio. And my mom, who was an art teacher out in the desert in West Texas, calls me on the phone one day and she says, hey, these people came and did a presentation at our faculty meeting. And they happen to live in San Antonio and they're looking for advisors. And so let me give you their name and number. So you can call them because she knew that I wasn't really happy with what I was doing. And so as soon as I hung up with her, literally, uh, Brad, I walked over and I threw the name and number in the garbage can and went about my day, right? Because par- parents don't know anything, right? Right. How so old were about, you at this time? Oh, I was 30. So, I don't know. Let's see. It was, that was about 2000, year 2000. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. So <clears throat> two weeks later, she calls. Hey, Russ, did you call those people? I said, gosh, I'm so glad you called because I lost the number. Can you share that with me again? And I was really not happy at, by this time about what I was doing. So I wrote the number down. I called the people. And within about two or three days, we were sitting at a, a coffee shop in San Antonio talking about the 403B marketplace and the K-12 through industry. And about 24 hours, after, 24 hours after that, I was studying for my test. 
Wow. So Russ, I'm picking up a theme in your life. When you decide <laughs> to go for something, whether it's getting married or changing your career, you just jump right in. Well, what I like to tell people is that when I came into the 403B deal, that uh, failure was not an option for me because all I knew is I had a wife and two starving children at home that needed to be diapered and fed, you know, so it just wasn't a choice to fail. Well, let's, we were talking before we hit record here and you said, Hey, I kind of grew up in this super niche space, the 403B market, obviously mm -hmm. the educational space. Mm -hmm. So what, um, you know, that's kind of a place where I've seen a lot of younger advisors cut their teeth. Mm -hmm. Um, so what did you learn along the way? What were some lessons that you learned from the early days that, that carry forward to today? Well, one of the first things I learned was that educators only make up about 3% of the working population in any city in the country, big town, small town, whatever, and they need help. And so it's a funny thing though, that I would get kind of, it's usually the female in the household, right? That's the educator would do some good things for her. And then all of a sudden. The, the husband sitting in front of me wanting to talk about his 401k. So some of the largest cases I wrote up until about five or six years ago were the husbands of my educator clients. Mm. So we've chosen, even though we're much more diversified now, we have chosen to um, um, stay close to the educator marketplace because I've invested uh, so much of my energy and passion into that because of my mom mm -hmm. that we we still have lots of fish chasing the boat that uh, people want our help because of our knowledge with the education system and pensions in general. Yeah. And so I grew up with the grandma that was a grade school teacher. Uh, my wife, Sarah taught before she decided to stay home with, with our children, her mom, her grandma taught. Um, so the 403B market does have some of those pension like qualities so what are some things that you had to learn to navigate that was maybe slightly different from the average retiree when you were dealing with those financial plans? Well, obviously gaining access to the employees during school hours is, is very um, tricky, but I never really chose to go that course anyway. I never sat in the lounge hoping to you know bother people when they came in to take a break between classes or whatever. So we learned pretty quickly how to get them, get in front of them off campus and just do some educational things for them. And then the referrals just started dropping out of the trees. So, but, you know, that was 20 years ago. I mean, today getting into campuses is, is exponentially harder because of security concerns. And um, also the spam filtration on the email system is pretty tight. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that I never really, you know, relied on, being in campus to do business. Otherwise, because I know guys that were completely out of business when the day co after COVID hit. Yeah. They were completely rely relying on getting into the school campus and there was no, there wasn't anything ha happening in schools. Yeah. On the campus. So anyway. Well, let's, let's rewind because there's a little gap in the story until we get to today. And that is, you know, your, your mom calls you, you kind of change careers uh, mm -hmm. weren't super happy where you were at dive into the 403b the educator space i'm assuming this was working for a captive agency or some some bigger firm owned by somebody else is that fair uh actually it was a um <clears throat> it was an agency owned by an individual but mm -hmm. we were independent we could we could you know have taken off with our clients anytime we wanted to the reason mm -hmm. i did not for a, a considerable period of time though was because I was getting so much value in learning that part of the business that I wanted to stick around, you know. Yeah. But eventually, life took me in a, diff uh, a slightly different direction, and you know, that agency actually imploded in the uh, mid two thousands, about two thousand six mm -hmm. or seven. So anyway, things things have worked out okay. But Let's talk about that for a second, because I, I think there are a lot of lessons. Um, one of the struggles a lot of founding advisors have in this space is going from a single player game to a multiplayer game, which is growing a team to where they're not just carrying the weight of, of the mm -hmm. business themselves. Looking back when you were the advisor underneath another advisor, what were things that that founder did right? And what were things that founder didn't do so right? 
Well, so let's get real, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's <laughs> um, go. Let's go. The guy that founded this agency was absolutely brilliant. Brilliant, okay? Mm -hmm. But he made some absolutely um, terrible life choices. Addic addiction, mm. infidelity, you know, gambling, all of those kinds of things. And so he couldn't keep his thing together. He couldn't keep a wonderful business together because of the poor uh, personal decisions that he was making. So that's really what caused him to lose his agency. Mm. My immediate upline in the business, they were not, they were not ethical. And so I broke away with, from them fairly quickly because I knew um, I learned what not to do. And also I've learned a lot of things about what to do. Right. And I think one of the reasons why we've survived in a business that has a 99% failure rate is because I've always treated people like they're family members of mine. Mm. The golden and rule. They figure, and they figured that out. And so they stay with me, you know, they stay with us. Yeah. Let's, um, let's go back to kind of lessons and you can learn lessons from people that do it right. And people that don't. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I've found that's very common just, and it's not just financial advisor space, it's, it's entrepreneurs in general. It's, mm -hmm. it's a very stressful job, yeah. you know, high highs, low lows. And one of the things that I've found because of that is self-medication to your point. Sometimes that's drugs. Sometimes that's alcohol. Sometimes that's infidelity. Mm -hmm. So what, being a guy that's been an entrepreneur for a long time, w what are ways that you found to navigate and not self-medicate for the wrong reasons in, in the business during the high highs and the low lows? I, I struggled with alcoholism myself, Brad. Mm. It almost killed me. It almost destroyed my marriage. It almost took my business away from me. And... I was self-medicating because of the stress and the pressure and all of those kind of things, right? Um, I came to an epiphany 13 years ago and decided to, with the help of my wife and my mom and my sister, that um, I was going to take a different direction and it saved my life. God gave me a second chance and I wouldn't trade my, my worst day sober for my best day when I was drinking. Mm. Wouldn't trade them. And here I am, you know, we've, we have watched this business flourish. We have so many people that love us and are loyal to us as our clients. And they bring us referrals like crazy. And, um, I wouldn't be able to see any of that if had I not survived, you know? Mm. So. Thanks for sharing that, man. I'll tell you what, Russ, that's one thing I've always loved about you, man, is you always keep it real. Um, like you said, I, before, before we went live, you're like, ask me anything. I'm an open book. And I, I hope, I hope that little life lesson there, I promise you right now, there's somebody listening in or watching in that's struggling with that right now. So I hope your story and your lesson there can show there can be a light at the end of that tunnel. You know, any advice you would give somebody if they're struggling with that right now? Like what, what help to seek or what, what to do about it? Absolutely. One of the, one of my steps in recovery says that if you want to stay sober, you have to give it away. You have to help others. Right. And so I always love to make myself available to people that just want to have a real conversation and like get, get honest and um, learn more about my, my pathway and my struggles. And, but you know, what I've d done to, um, and God has done to overcome those things for me. Um because it's not doing anybody good if, if I just put a lampshade over my head, right? And it doesn't shine out for other people. So that's what I try to do in business. And I try to do that in life as well, is to let my light shine so that I can possibly be a positive impact in somebody else's life. And it's, you know, when somebody's in the middle of, of an addiction thing, they, I was so lonely. Mm. The last thing I wanted to do was to pick up the phone and call somebody or go see somebody and say, hey, man, can you sit down and talk? And that's what kills a lot of people is they don't do that. So I didn't, you know, so I, I don't know. My heart is very full talking about this today. But I know that there are people that are watching this today that are struggling with something. 
But if they don't, if they don't reach out to somebody and just chat, you know, how are they going to get better? Yeah. You know, I don't know. The, well, the definition, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting a different result. Right. So if you want something different, you got to do something different. Yeah. And that's what I was lucky enough to be a part of. Yeah. You, um, you remind me of advice I got. Well, we were just in a, a small group with Michael Hyatt, who I know you admire and has been a coach to both of us. Um, I remember when he was talking about a struggle he had that was kind of being a workaholic and, you know, his, his wife sat him down and had the talk and he had resisted. I think us guys, sometimes number one, we're slow learners, right? Um, but sometimes we try to put on this, this armor and it doesn't do us any good and like resists help or reaching out to somebody. And, and Michael shared that, he finally was convinced to go sit down for therapy and the, yeah. you know, one of the first words of advice was, Hey, you know, it's the healthy people that sit down and talk to people. It's the right. unhealthy ones that bottle it up and try I to remember him saying that, by yeah. themselves. Mm -hmm. Thank God he gave me that advice. Um, because it, it's helped me, you know, I, I think this path of entrepreneurship, it's, it's the most rewarding, but it, some days it's, it sucks. Let's just be real. Some days you're, you feel like you're, you're battling these battles alone. And I, I think every entrepreneur that I've ever talked with, that's honest and real with themselves. They say, yeah, some, sometimes you just need a circle of people to lean on. And so well, Brad, you, you asked earlier, well, Russ, how, how have you dealt with the stress and the pressure and all that? Right. And then I got onto this rabbit trail. Yeah. Every, you know, life does suck sometimes and things happen all the time, don't they? And so the question is, what tools do we have in our toolbox to deal with those things? And are they healthy tools or are they unhealthy tools, right? But you have to have tools. Mm. You can't just say, well, I'm not going to drink anymore, but I'm not going to, but I'm, I still don't know how to deal with the issues because you're going to be right back on the bottle. Yeah. I apologize if I was kind of getting on a little bit of a, a, a soapbox about that, but this life or death stuff, you know? So I don't apologize at all. I've, I promise. I've learned how to put the, the right kind of tools in my box where when life is not fun that I've got those tools to go to and not the ones I was using previously. Can you share an example of one of those tools? If somebody's out there and like, man, when I have a rough day at the office, I go home and mix up a couple of drinks and that's my solution. What, what tools would you suggest they replace it with? A 10 minute walk around the block calling somebody that they really can consider them a real friend, not a fair weather friend and say, you know, what, man, I got to tell you what happened today. I think just talking to another person is so powerful when you're struggling, you know, social media wants us to believe that everybody's life is all perfect. Right. And it's not, that's the big lie, isn't it? <clears throat> and so call somebody while you're taking your walk <laughs> and say, man, I got to, I need somebody to talk to. Mm -hmm. And the person you're calling doesn't necessarily even have to have a solution. It's just being present. That's golden. But you know, I have, I have my photography. And so that's something that I can do pretty immediately. If I'm, you know, really suffering, go grab my camera bag and drive out a little ways and go take some pictures. Or I can, uh, pick up one of my World War II books and read a little history or whatever, you know, but. Well, fun fact. Everybody's tools are going to be a little different, you know? Yeah. Fun fact for those that are watching on video, they see a, uh, a picture of, there's actually a couple planes. One of them's kind of cut off, but, um, you should, you should share. There you go. Um, one of the things I've come to appreciate about you is you, you're a, you have an eclectic taste in hobbies <laughs> and interests, which is very similar to me. Um, so let's on the, the world war two and like finding hobbies in places where your attention can go. That's kind of that, that stress reliever. You know, that's one of the things I found is, is kind of sometimes missing in a lot of advisors and entrepreneurs lives is they're just grinding, grinding, grinding. And it's, and it's this constant stress where there isn't a break or a, 
distraction that's a healthy version. Um, so is, has World War kind of the year, I know that you know just about everything about World War II planes. <laughs> has that been one of the ways that you go to when you just need to relax and unplug? I love world military history, but I think the photography is really something that I would gravitate more to because I can do that anytime. I can't always go drive down the street and see an old warbird. Yeah. You know, in, in somebody's driveway or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's go to, I, I just want to take a second. I just want to acknowledge you and say, thanks for keeping it real, man. That's, that's what I love about this podcast. It, it's not the surface level conversations. It's the real ones because that's where people can learn and grow. And that's where I, I promise you're serving some people listening in and hopefully that gives them a little nudge if they're struggling there that, you know, really successful people, which you are one, all of us have things that, that we've had to, to battle through adversities we've had to overcome. And so I want to fast forward a little bit because you just had a record year last year. So let's, that, let's get to the, the, the fun part of like how yeah. you've grown and evolved. And, right. um, last year, so we record this early 2024, uh, last year you finished right about 35 million of total assets. Uh, that was about 50% growth over the prior year. Mm. Team almost doubled uh, up to nine team members now, including yourself. So give us some of that evolution of the early 403B days. You overcame some obstacles, some battles, and, and kind of catch us up maybe a few mile, mile markers along the way and the success you're having today. It's really crazy because when I got in the 403B thing, the only thing I knew about money is that I didn't have any of it. <laughs> you know, and I've learned everything just from the hardest way you can possibly learn things. But um, you've heard several people, triad offices say that they feel like they're in what they call the storming phase. Mm. And I know that we've been in the storming phase for probably ever since we joined triad. We are starting now to step out of that a little bit. And I'm, so happy about that, right? So that I can spend more time working on the business rather than just working in the business. And as our team has grown, we're really starting, I'm starting to see the benefits of being able to empower other team members to just take ownership of certain things. And then that's off my plate. And if they need me, they can come and find me. Or if they want some coaching on that or whatever. So that's been a great thing for us. I've, I really have been wondering <clears throat> wondered for the last few years if I was ever going to get out of the storming phase, but now I feel like I can see some light at the end of the tunnel on that. Yeah, well, congratulations, <laughs> because I know you've worked your butt off, and and that's the thing that I've seen, you know, in the, the last just over three years in, in Triad's existence. Um, when your mission is to help advisors like yourself level up in business and life, one of the learnings I've had is, number one, if you throw that out there, I've never heard somebody decline that offer. Like, oh, I I don't want to level up in business and life. Right. Um, I think most people, if they're honest, that, that's something that's very, uh, it's a North Star that people want to move towards. But one of the yeah. things I've seen is a lot of people just aren't willing to do the work because it's very different. You, you shared, and I ask you permission, so I'm going to share it now before we hit record. Um, we did a private mastermind uh, with Michael Hyatt out at launch in Scottsdale. And we did something uh, that's called, called a spotlight seat. So we had uh, 11, 12 different trad member offices there. You were the very last one to go. Ooh. And just like this interview so far, you were real and raw. And you said, hey, I'll paraphrase. So anything I missed, feel free to, to chime in on. But you said something to the effect of, hey, I, I feel like I've been pretty fortunate in my career. I've naturally kind of always had some sales skills. I've naturally had the ability to build relationships and connect. But as I transition into needing to lead a team instead of be the guy, um, sometimes I feel like an imposter. Sometimes I, I struggle with that. Mm -hmm. And Michael Hyde in that moment, he, he, he paused you. He said, Hey, Anybody else feel like this too? And he looked around the room and you saw every single hand go up from every single. And we've got, we had people in there gathering anywhere from 20 million to north of a hundred million a year. And every single hand went up, including my own. And 
that just shared so much. So what, what was your lesson from that? What was what in that journey of great salesperson to leader and business owner, what are the, some of the things you've learned as you, as you get out of that storm? Well, that experience in Scottsdale <clears throat> married with the other experiences that I've been able to um, spend time with and get to know some of the other founders that I truly know that I'm not alone. Mm. I'm not the only person that's ever felt like an idiot trying to run a company. Mm. So that's, I mean, that doesn't necessarily make me feel like it goes, that problem goes away, but at least I know that I've got other people I can call and say, Hey, can you, can I bounce something off of you? Or, you know, what's, what's your opinion about X, Y, or Z? I was just on the phone with another office a couple of days ago, a guy called me and was asking me some questions. He goes, oh man, I'm so glad I got to talk to you. Well, I'm glad to get to talk to other people too. And the Triad family, you know, I really do believe in the bottom of my heart that the Triad family cares about us like we're your family members. And that we can talk to you about anything we want to talk about. And that you'll be there for us. And I'm very, very grateful for that. Thanks, man. It's uh, It's been quite the journey on our side too, but I will tell you one of the things that I love about the community we're all building together <clears throat> is the real authentic, great humans. And to your, to your point on you're not alone, mm -hmm. it's everything we just talked about before, how you overcame the adversity of alcoholism, um, a ton of adversity when it comes to building a business and you know, new day, new issues going to pop up. That's just part of being an mm -hmm. entrepreneur. And I think the theme of your just don't do it alone is a really good one on the mm -hmm. business front and the life front. Yep. So what, um, as you have, mm -hmm. I think there's this back to single player game versus now a team of nine. Mm -hmm. What are some of those lessons as you step out of it being all about Russ, you know, the solo advisor, making all the sales, doing everything himself to now needing to lead a team, empower a team. What are some lessons you could share out there that might help other founders going through that same transition? One thing I've really tried hard to internalize over the last few months is I think Michael Hyatt might've said this. He said, you know, if someone else does it 80% as good as you could have done it, that's perfectly fine. Mm. Because when I was doing everything, everything had to be like, you know, just perfect, right? Because it's got my hand on it. But I'm okay with a team member doing something 60 or 70%, right? We need to be in the 80% range if we can, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't need to get high blood pressure over that other 10 or 20%. Which is Russian, easy to say. Easier said. It's real. Say, it's right? real easy to say that. I know it is. You know. Well, but I think everybody that everybody knows that if you don't let go of some things, you're going to hit a plateau, income wise. That you, it's a, it's over. That's how much. That's the most amount of money that you could, you're ever going to make going forward if you don't let go of some things, and um, empower other people to help you get where where you want to go. Yeah, it's 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 funny because you know, I, from my experience, there's some really intelligent advisors out there, entrepreneurs, and it, none of this is rocket science. Of like, yeah. hey, if if the business is all about you, you're capping that that growth. Yeah. What is it though? You think like if we really get into the psychology, back to easier said than done. What is it that you think is this just like grasping and not being able to let go as a founder as an advisor? What is it that drives that? You know, when Michelle and I started out, <clears throat> I literally had a battery powered printer in the trunk of my car and a little banker's box with some hanging files in it. Because in those days, we hand wrote uh, carbon app, a new, you know, 403B applications, right? And yeah. we kind of took over the little corner of our kids' playroom upstairs in the house that we were living in at the time. I mean, we did everything. And we did everything for a long period of time. And when all of a sudden you go, you need to hire this person over here and let her do him or her X, Y, and Z. Well, the, the other little angel on the shoulder says, wait a minute. You can't let them do that because they won't do a good job like you do. Hmm. Right? But it's either that or go nuts. <laughs> right? 
you so pick your poison, you know? <laughs> Good advice. Yeah. Well, you, you brought up Michelle, your wife. Um, yeah. We talked about her a little earlier and, and you guys have been married for almost three decades now. And how long were you in the business before she joined you? How, how far into the journey? A little over three years. Three years. And was it the like default, I need help, honey? Like you're the cheapest help I can hire or did she actually want to come into the business? How did that happen? No, she wanted to, she wanted to, th this thing to be something that we did together. Mm -hmm. But as our kids got a little bit older, she took a little 18 year break to finish helping raise two fantastic kids. And, uh, and then she rejoined us about um, five years ago. Let's talk about running a business and also staying happily married, because I know in our industry, <laughs> there are, <laughs> there are a lot of husband wife teams um, and that comes with pros and cons. So what lessons would you share for other husband wife duos out there, or maybe even just fam, you know, family members in the business in general? Well, I think one of the only things that saves us in our firm is that she's up at the front grading people and I'm in the back talking to clients and prospects, right? Because she wouldn't deal with me all day, every day, and then at nighttime too. That just wouldn't work for her. <laughs> so we try to find some things that we enjoy doing together. We love going to antique malls and looking at old things. And sometimes we'll drive 100 or 200 miles away from the Dallas-Fort Worth area, just make a little road trip and look at some things. Maybe we don't even buy anything, but it's just something we both enjoy doing and being, and being present and not talking about work the whole time. The whole time. And that's that really, like? and that's really hard to not talk about work at night, Yeah, you know, but we're, we're trying our best though, to be better about that. Well, I was going to ask you mm -hmm. because I, I would think that would be really hard to kind of separate where mm -hmm. the work doesn't bleed into every single conversation because, mm -hmm. you know, this, this business just doesn't turn off, you know, it's the blessing and the curse of this business. You never end a day and the work is done. Mm -hmm. Um, but how, what are some rhythms or some lessons that you've learned over the years to be able to do that? One big thing that I made a decision on uh, quite some time ago is I refused to bring my laptop home. Because when I did, I would immediately walk in the door, set it up on the kitchen counter, open it up and fire it back up again. And now we're open for business again. Right. Mm -hmm. And the kids are over here. They're very small. They're over here wondering when they're going to get some dad time and they're not getting it. So that was a big step for me is to say, you know what, when it's over, it's over. Because I really don't know of anything that can happen in our industry that cannot wait until tomorrow. Or if it happens on a Friday that can't wait till Monday. I mean, if somebody passes away, that's not a cause for an emergency on my side. Mm -hmm. Because nobody's open till Monday anyway to, to speak with, to about that, right? So I think it's just a decision that we're ne probably none of us are ever going to be perfect about, but that we just say we're closed and closed means closed. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, we're never really closed. We're off, you know, we're doing life now. We're switching yeah. to the do life channel for the rest of the night. You know? Yeah. Well, and I, I've had this conversation <laughs> with a lot of advisors over the years and mm -hmm. you're in a different life stage than me. You know, your, your kids aren't at home anymore. Mine are. And, but, but I've just found like, there's almost this entrepreneurial lie or myth of, oh my gosh, if my client calls and I'm not there, they're going to fire me. And the truth is if you communicate and say, Hey, um, you know, here are our office hours, eight to five or whatever they are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're going to serve you at the highest level possible during those hours. But also, by the way, I made a commitment to my wife and family, like after five, I've committed to be the best husband and dad that I can be. And I hope you can respect that. I mean, I find very, like, if you share that from your heart, number one, if anybody objects to that, do you want to work with them in the first place? Right. Right. And so I, I just find like setting those boundaries, <laughs> any younger advisors don't do it because they just... They just don't think about it. And then before long, the business is eating them alive. So are there any other kind of what I would call rituals or rhythms that you picked up or learned over the years that you could like, if you were a 
25 or 30 year old advisor out there in that former phase of life that you were in that you could just advice you could give them? Well, I'll try to be quick on this. So let's say that your, your client's name is Sally Smith. Okay. And Sally wants to talk to you at 10 o'clock on a Friday night because she wants to change her address, right? Can she call her doctor and do that? Can she call her CPA or um, her attorney or any, can she call anybody else and they're, they're going to respond to her right then and there? No. What I had to do, I had this epiphany and I had to decide that I'm not a sales dude anymore. I'm a professional just like the doctor or the attorney or the CPA or whatever. And professionals don't respond to fires outside of business hours. I mean, because it's not, it's not necessary, right? And I think that the sooner that a younger advisor can bring that into their being and, and you know, and, so, and, I, and I stopped putting my cell phone number on my cards. My cell phone number is nowhere to be found on any of our materials because people will abuse it. Mm. So I just, I just, it was just a decision that I had to make that I'm not going to run, continue to run my life like that. You know, my, my, uh, God bless my little 81 year old mother-in-law over in Dallas. You know, she's a top producer in real estate and has been for probably 40 years. She'll answer the phone at two o'clock in the morning. Hmm. And I'm going, why are you doing that to yourself? Cause she just stays in this constant state of upheaval. Hope she didn't watch the podcast, but anyway, you know, she's just always worked up, worked up, worked up. Well, you're in, we are in control about when we're going to be worked up and we can yeah. say no. So that would, that would probably be one of the biggest things that I could tell somebody that's younger, the faster you adopt that attitude, the lower your blood pressure is going to be. Yeah. I love that. You're spot on. And I think as a, I felt victim of this too. And I was a young salesperson as a salesperson's always on. Right. Yep. And then what I realized the, the other side of that too, that I found on my side, Russ is okay. So you answer the phone call at 6 PM, excuse yourself from the family dinner table, whatever. Well, now you've just trained that individual that those are office hours for you. So then they call you yeah, again at 6 right. PM and then right. you retrain them that it's okay. And so by surely accepting it the first time, you're enabling it for the next time. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a it's a vicious cycle if you don't. You're actually it. encouraging more of that behavior. So 100%. my little phrase is we have to manage clients' expectations. And one of those expectations is that I'm not available to you 25-8. You know, love you to death and I love you as a client, but I'm not available to you 25-8. 20, so that's uh, a oh, 24, <laughs> you just added an extra hour and an extra day in the week. Is that what we you did. did? We want to cover all the bases down here in Texas. Okay. <laughs> so that's for the, that's for the leap years, huh? That's which, is, right. which is this year. So yeah, doesn't it doesn't matter right. what year it is. Love it. That's right. Um, okay. So let's go to number one. I think number one, I, I wish I would have had this podcast when I was a young guy, just getting into the space. Oh, yeah. yep. So um, I love that you shared that kind of lessons learned. Let's go to, um, we talked about anything else on the family side, um, maybe like specific to spouses, um, because I, I get kind of how you're protecting family time there, but anything with you and Michelle lessons learned, if you were like being like marriage counselor for husband, wife teams out there, any other advice you'd share there before we get off the topic? Well, I always tell people and I tell clients this all the time, she should have dumped me a long time ago. Okay. So I'm not sure how much, how qualified I am to give marriage counseling, but <clears throat> I'm trying to be better about like being present and like not scrolling through my phone while she's trying to talk to me, put the phone down and look at her and be present. And that was, came from Chris Smith, right? Yeah. He talked about that in Scottsdale recently. Um, but I want her to be present too. I mean that, you know, all these things go, go both ways. So trying to find out what's important to your spouse and honor that and prioritize that. Even if it's not a priority of yours, you know, Michelle would go to air shows with me and, you know, all the time she could care less about airplanes, but she cares about me. 
And so she wanted to go along because she knew that that's what I liked. She could care less about those things, right? And so I try to do some some stuff with her that I, I, I care nothing about, right? Except I want I care about her, and I want her to know that that I care about her through my through my actions. And I'm not going to ever be perfect at that, but that's what I'm striving for. Well, I'll tell you who we need to make sure listens to this is Michelle. I think you're <laughs> I think you're going to get a few points for this one, buddy. He's going to want to maybe submit some corrections, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. We'll do an episode with her, and she'll she'll basically yeah, set the record that's, straight, right? That's right. Yep. Um. Well, let's go into man. I feel like this is becoming quite the podcast for you. You've overcome your fair share of adversity over the years, but um, some probably many people don't know this, but you had a pretty serious health issue uh not too long ago and we've talked about some of the adversity but i know there have been a number of advisors unfortunately that i've worked with over the years that had some pretty serious health scares and so if you don't mind sharing i think you said you were cool with it um kind of share a little context and then how you were able to to battle through that as well so you're actually going to get me to cry before this thing's over aren't you that's, that's not my goal, but um, I'll tell you what, dude, um, if you're crying, I probably will be too. I found out about six years ago that I have a form of blood cancer that is not supposed to shorten my lifespan, but I, I still have it, okay? And um, it was causing me to have some unbearable f uh, fatigue. And when I first got diagnosed with this, I was um, I'm kind of tooling along pretty good up until about three years ago. And um, one day I woke up and I was, I just couldn't get out of bed. I was slept all night and I couldn't hold my eyes open. I was so fatigued. And so um, I started working with doctors to figure out what we could do to address this fatigue situation, right? So in, I guess it was uh, 2022, I missed three months of work all at one time. I couldn't get out of bed. And I'm thinking to myself, this, this is not a formula that's this going to work very well long term, you know. And Nick Whitaker, my coach, I spoke to him personally about this. And he said, Russ, he told me about his struggle with um, Lyme's disease, right? Mm -hmm. He said, dude, if you've got to go through 23 doctors, do not give up. Don't give up. Because when you find the one that can help you, you're going to get better quickly. And so for two years, I had to say that to myself every day. Nick said, don't give up, don't give up, don't give up. And we probably went through, I don't know, 10, 12 doctors, and we finally figured out what we could do about the fatigue. And so that I found out about that about the middle of the year last year. And, and prior to that, I'd missed another two months for it, correct? Right? But ever since we found the, the remedy for that, I've been at work all day long, every every doggone day. And I have to, and I have to be honest, I was, I'd was i be laying in bed thinking, you know, if I can't be present for my clients and help them, and if I can't be present for my team, like maybe I should sell. Because it's not fair to them. It's not fair to my clients, right? It's not fair to my team. Well, thank God I don't act quickly on thoughts anymore. <laughs> That's from when the drinking days were, right? right so right. I don't, I don't, I'm not thinking about selling anytime soon now because we're we're rocking and rolling. 2024 is going to be a, a fantastic year, but I'm so thankful that I did not give up. Like Nick told me, don't give up. And I think that's good advice for not only just a health issue, but anything that you're struggling with. Don't give up. There's people out there that can help you, whether it's a friend or a doctor, you know, whatever, whatever issues that we're dealing with, there's people out there that want to help us or that we want to help, right? So that they don't give up. So that's what keeps me going. And, uh, but for a while I was cursing Nick at night when I go to sleep, well, doggone it, Nick, you're insisting that I stay with, you know, the fight, and, but I did and I got better. Well, I think obviously it's a great life lesson, whether it's a health issue, whether it, uh, any, anything you run into like that, the battle's never over until you say it's over. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
once again, like you're dropping all kinds of life lessons here. This is, this is very much like, this is a, a DBDL, but this is stuff that applies so much to, to do life, whether you're a financial advisor or not. And, um, well, Brad, I had no idea what we were going to talk about today. I really didn't. I just knew that I was glad to get to talk to you. Appreciate it, buddy. It's mutual. Yeah, you bet. What, um, when you were struggling or when you first were diagnosed with this, I'm assuming the instant thought, I've never dealt with anything like this, but it, it's probably pretty shocking. You kind of want to probably deny it. Mm -hmm. um, how, how did you process it? And how did you, obviously Nick gave you great advice, but how did you process it um, so you could actually battle through the thing and not, I guess, feel sorry for yourself for lack of a better term? I don't remember the name of the movie, but you remember the the movie where the guy found out he was terminally ill and he goes nuts trying to film stuff for his kids, like teaching them how to play ball or this or that or the other. He wanted to like parent them before he died that they could watch that stuff as they grew up. That's I, I, that's kind of that's kind of what I started thinking about. Like, oh man, if, if I'm not going to make it, I got some stuff I need to write down, you know, mm. or to say. Uh, it was it was a profound impact on me in the beginning. And I didn't really want to believe my hematologist when they said, now look, this is not going to kill you. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, sure. <laughs> sure, it's blood cancer. It's going to kill me. But, you know, I've kind of gotten over that now. But yeah, yeah it, it shook me up very badly. Two, two of the most powerful books I've ever read mm -hmm. in my life. Were, um, one's called Not Fade Away. Okay. And the other one is When Breath Becomes Air. And both of them were written by two guys that were terminally ill. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, when breath becomes air, I remember I was on an airplane, I was listening to an audio book and it was this, um, neurosurgeon, um, mm. that had, had cancer and basically like his time was limited and he was writing the book, like in the last year of his life. And his wife wrote the, the ending after he'd passed away. Okay. And. I will say for anybody that wants a powerful book, I was on an airplane with tears streaming down my face, like thinking like if people like see what's going on over here, they're going to think I'm having like a mental breakdown right now on an airplane. But there it's crazy how a lot of people like that, I, you know, I've fortunately never dealt with anything like that, but they've said like, that's where the most clarity comes from is when all of a sudden it's not this someday thought it's like, no, my time. Right might be yeah. So did you have any of that happen yourself where like you got crystal clear on like, here's yeah, the stuff yeah. that matters to me and here's the stuff that doesn't. <clears throat> yeah. That's when I started firing some pain in the rear end clients. Really? <laughs> I did. So, you know what? Too, if I don't have much short. time left, I don't have time to deal with you. <laughs> <laughs> really? Well, there's some instant benefits, right? Sure. Well, and I did, I did that on the personal side too. I said, look, I don't, time is short, you know, I mean, that's, that's a cliche that we all hear. Oh, time's short. Yeah, sure. But it is short. And um, we don't, you know, we shouldn't be wasting time on people that bring us down. But it's hard not to do sometimes. You know, um, on the Toby Keith thing recently, you know, um, mm -hmm. I saw on YouTube when he did that final performance out in Vegas in December. And I'd never heard that song, Don't Let the Old Man In. Oh, mm -hmm. my gosh, that tore me up. What a beautifully touching song. You know, the guy's standing there on stage in Vegas and he knows he knows he's not going to be here long. And the lyrics to that song are absolutely powerful. So that's a little phrase that I'm starting to carry on with myself now is don't let the old man in. Because once he gets in, you know, don't let him in. Yeah. Or the old or the old woman for some of our female viewers. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's make sure we'll Charlie, if you can, let's grab that and throw that in the show notes. Is there, was there a video of it? Yeah. Oh yeah. Let's yeah. Let's grab that video. We'll put it in the show notes. So those listening in or watching in can check that out. Um, yeah, that that's sad. I actually saw Toby Keith live at, uh, probably 10, 10 years ago now. And he's, he was quite the performer, quite, oh, quite, yeah, sure. quite the energy. <clears throat> um, and just a good guy too. You know? Yeah. 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 Just a good old boy, for sure. Yep. Well, let's go to, I know we're we're getting towards the tail end here, and man, time has flown on us. But um, 
Let's flip back over to the do business side. And mm -hmm. obviously you crushed it last year. Um, you were joking with me. You're like, we had our best year ever. And honestly, like we didn't do a ton of marketing. Most of it was referral based, loving on those clients, taking care of those clients. So mm -hmm. when it comes to just relationships, which I've seen you, you just like, it's one of your gifts. What sort of things does your firm do to just take those relationships up a couple notches where you continue to get repeat business and referrals? Great question, Brad. A number of years ago, <clears throat> we um, took the Bill Good Marketing people out in Utah on as the vendor. Mm -hmm. And I send out a, a, a paper letter every month to all of our clients. I do not write the content. I get to go into the Bill Good, you know, letters library, and they've got thousands and thousands of really fantastic stories. And really all the, the, the letters I send out, they don't say, come in and let me sell you something. It's about us. It's a storytelling. And what people do is they call and they said, you know, I cried when I read that story and I read it out loud when our family was together at Thanksgiving. Or, you know, Russ, I took that letter to my school and I read it to every one of my students. Mm. So it's, it's just about creating a top of mind awareness on a, on a regular basis. And it's just a machine that kind of runs in the background for me. So I don't even have to choose what the letter is. I've got somebody that does that here for me. Right. <clears throat> but it's, but it's always in the background doing something. The other thing I do um, to share my photography is I've, I create birthday cards with something that I took a photo of, and then I d design what the little phrase is inside of the card. Mm -hmm. And every person, I've got one that goes out for the guys and one that goes out for the gals. And everybody gets a, a, a birthday card for me every year. And I'll, people call and tell me that they, you know, they have them folded up like sitting on their on their fireplace mantle or whatever because they love the, the picture and they've got them like lined up across the fireplace or whatever. It's just simple things that are simple, but nobody does anything personally anymore, really. Hmm. Well, you're, I've seen some of your photography. Uh, I remember the South Carolina trip, um, mm -hmm. Palmetto Bluff. You took some great photos down there. Yep. And uh, so do your clients, do they know that that is your photography? Like, do you put that in the card? Like, hey, I took uh, this picture at this location or how do they know? Uh, yeah, underneath the photo, I put, what the photo is like P51 Mustang and, you know, um, and where I took the photo. And then over there on the other side, I put photo by Russ Ross. Yeah. And then I put a little link on the back of the card or I write down on, on the link for my site. If you want to go see some of the other work that you can go and see more, but enjoy doing that. Well, I, you're taking me back. There's a, an advisor out of DC named Barry Glassman that I, I interviewed a number of years back, also a photographer. And one of the things he did that I thought was really cool, he, he uh, took some of his favorite photographs mm -hmm. and he made like a, um, like a coffee table book mm -hmm. um, to where he printed those out and he shared that with his clients. And, you know, yep. you think about that, you have, you have that's guests right. over and of course, what's this? Oh, that's my advisor. Yeah. He's a photographer as well. And now you're a topic of conversation and he would also, the other thing he did is he had a website, sounds like similar to what you have, to where any print that his clients requested, obviously it was under the gifting limit, but as long as it was under the gifting limit, they could order the print and he would mail it out to them. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you've tried any of that stuff. Sounds like you're obviously incorporating it in a lot of different ways, but I thought that was a pretty creative way that he had done it. We're going to do the book this year. That's a great idea. Like that easy? You were already working on it or boom, you're just doing it based on that idea. I'm working on it as of you telling me about it. <laughs> I love it. That's some implementation. What are your, um, what's your favorite photo you've ever taken? I know that's a hard question, but if you could only pick one. Most people don't know that there are majestic and beautiful mountains in the state of Texas. And they're out in far West Texas near the Mexican border. And I climbed up on top of a, of a pile of rocks before the sun came up. And I watched as the sun came up. I was looking over the Rio Grande River. 
and it looked like that God had taken a pitcher of sunshine and was slowly pouring it down that canyon. That captured that image. There was nobody inside. It was perfectly peaceful. This is a great place to be. Hmm. Do you have a uh, you have a copy of that picture that we could put in the show notes? I'll email I'll email it to you today. Please do <laughs> throw it right in there for you. Great. Well, my man, I know you 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 warned us before we went live here that yeah. the allergies were acting up. So if you need to you know grab some water or anything, go for it. But um, well, I I think that is a great one to end on. And as you know, this is the, the do business, do life podcast. So I would love to ask you one final question. And that is what is Russ Ross's definition of do business, do life. Do both with passion and robustness, but when it's time to do life, then the doing the business gets to take over tomorrow. But embrace both with passion and do the, do those things like you're doing it for God. Because I feel like he's the, he's the ultimate judge of our efforts. And have, have fun during the day, you know. We, we joke around and tell jokes and laugh all day long at work, you know. I'm not going to come up here and do the thing if we can't have fun while we're at work. Just keep a lighthearted atmosphere. People like that. Team members and clients like that. In my in my company, they do. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think uh, I think in most companies they do. Yeah, it's a lot more fun if you don't take yourself too seriously and you have a good time along the way. I tell prospects if you want the guy with the heavy starch white shirt and two hundred dollar tie on, I'll give you his phone number. But he doesn't work in this building. <laughs> you know i bet that generates a smile most days when you say i've, that. I've never lost a prospect over that <laughs> yeah yeah well cool my man this has been uh a great conversation and as <clears throat> always i appreciate the realness the authenticity you always bring and uh that's why every time we get together i always enjoy our conversations wherever they go so russ thank well, you my man <laughs> and uh look forward to the next time when we get to do it in person Thanks again for having me, Brad. Take care. All right, Russ. See you, buddy. Mm -hmm.